Okay, hello and welcome everybody to um, TEN's inaugural pitch event of the year. We're really excited to have y'all. Uh, and we have seven amazing companies for everybody today. Um, I'm gonna start by just handing the mic off to our CEO, Hall Martin, to tell you a little bit more about TEN before we get started. Um, so Hall, why don't you come up here and talk to the good people. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Well, thank you everybody for joining us here today. It's been four years since we actually did in-person events. We actually started 10 Capital back in 2009 and have been working ever since. And at, up until the, just before the pandemic, we would actually do 31 events around the country. It was a lot of fun, but we also did them by ourselves. And this time we're doing them with a lot of our partners. So we actually are having a number of cities that we'll be going to around the country as well. The one rule I had in going around the, rule, around the country is that in the summer, we're going to be in the north. And in the winter, we're going to be in the south. And don't ask me to go to Boston in December and don't ask me to go to Houston in July. We're gonna swap, swap those things around. So we've, we've learned how to do that. But I wanna thank you guys for joining us today. It's great to see so many faces I've seen before and see them back here in action with us today. Appreciate you guys coming out. And so I wanna introduce this new series we have called 10 Capital Live. That means we're in person. It's also a hybrid event. It's online as well. A lot of people are zooming in, listening to what we're doing right now. And we came up with the idea of calling it the funding funnel because just like there's a sales funnel where you're driving customers through your process, so there's the funding funnel where you're trying to drive investors through your fundraise as well. And that's what 10 Capital does. We help companies connect with investors. We help investors connect with companies. And the other thing we do is we form capital. We help angel groups find members. We help VC funds find limited partners through primarily family offices. We have family office panels, but we do that. And we're also bringing more angel groups to Texas. We're actually bringing a Koretsu forum here to the Texas region. It's the last big state in the country that does not have a Koretsu. In fact, Koretsu is the number two uh, Texas is the number two uh, state for Koretsu funded deals, but there was no Koretsu here. They all went to other, other states to do that. So there's a lot of startups that are going to benefit from this and a lot of investors that are going to benefit from that as well. So we're basically, we're forming capital. We're helping more people come and raise funding for their startup here in Texas as well. So with that, I want to thank you guys for coming out and looking forward to catching up with you in the happy hours as well. Got seven great deals up here for you to look at today, and then we'll have discussions with you afterwards. With that, I'd like to introduce our investor panel. I'd like to go ahead and start off with Leanne, if you can, and tell us more about yourself and introduce your group to the audience. Just pass the mic out. So you stand up and sure. yep. uh, Hi, I'm Leanne Yang. I'm with the Horn Frog Investment Network out of TCU. So I'm a program director for the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation there. Thank you. Well, that was quick. That was great. Yeah. I'm expecting that quick. So Ed Pierce, uh, I'm from Dallas, all along with Tamano and Doug. We're with the Lion's Den. So the Lion's Den basically connects startup companies with uh, investors. We have a large investor network and we get companies funded. Really has a faith-based element to it. So for-profit companies where we wanna know what you're doing for God's kingdom. And so that's a great venue to have people come together and really just have a great um, amount of synergy and networking. And so we've known Paul and the group for several years and we're happy to continue that relationship. So looking forward to today. I'm Gary Forney, I'm chairperson for the Central Texas Angel Network, CTA for short. We're the local angel organization. Uh, we put together roughly 125 million in deals, over 200 companies over the last 16, 17 years we've been in existence. We're broad, broad based generalist investors across the board. Um, so if you have a startup in Central Texas, not just, in, not just Austin, please come, please apply to us, centraltexasangelnetwork.com. Hi, everyone. I'm Jia Li. I'm with Oxy Ventures. We focus on cybersecurity investing. I've been in Austin for over 10 years now, so I wanted to boast that I'm a long timer. However, just realized that so many of you beat me, but don't feel bad if you've only been here for a little while. And welcome to Austin. And thank you, Hall, for building the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem here. Really appreciate it and look forward to meeting all of you. Thanks. Thank you guys for joining us here today. With that, I'll pass it back over to Shane, who will talk about our program. 
Great. Yeah. So today we do have seven great companies, as Hall mentioned. Um, I do want to get into it pretty quickly here just because we are um, a little bit on a tight schedule. Uh, if you do have any questions outside of our panel of judges, please either write them down if we don't get them, get to them, because we will have time in the networking portion after this where you can go up and ask your questions. Um, or if we do have time, we might, you know, go out and pass the mic around. Um, with that, I'm going to bring up our first company. Not sure where he's at at the moment, but Brookwood, uh, come on up here and get us started um, whenever you're ready. <laughs> and also, yeah, stick around. We will have happy hour after this. I know you guys are dying for some good eats and good drinks, so we'll get to that as soon as we can, I promise. But um, with that, I'm going to pass it off once we get the uh, presentation going. Go to the next slide. Shoot. Next slide. I think the latest statistics coming out of the University of Michigan was that, you know, close to 25% of the population of Michigan is going to be the, over the age of 60 by 2030, uh, which is not that far off. And historically, they're down for homes in order to leave the state. That's not happening anymore. So we said, okay, a great opportunity to really. Not just, you know, to make money, but at the end of the day, you're really doing something great for the state, great for the community, and you're giving back. We call it uh, garden style uh, ranches, means they're private entrances, private, they're not sharing any areas except community center. It's beautiful. So it gives them the ability to be in a completely smart enabled, green friendly home, 1240 square feet, Beautiful community, nature trails, dog parks, community center that's affordable. And it's been very well received. And by doing all that, we didn't forget also our investors. It's going to be highly profitable because of the simple fact that there's not a lot of competition. And we control every aspect of it. The construction is part of the Brookwood team. The, the major consultants are hired by the Brookwood team. And we're pinching every penny. We're super excited about what's yet to come, genuinely helping our state and our communities and hopefully our country. And I'm dedicated to it. And I, you know, I know that this thing is going to work out. I know this thing is going to. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for sitting through that. We thought that's a good overview instead of me talking. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't wearing the same jacket as the video because that would be kind of awkward. But <laughs> we're not a high tech company. We are a real estate uh, development firm out of Michigan and Brookwood Senior Living. We are currently developing four projects. We're here to introduce to you our Regulation A raise of Brookwood Fenton. It's a 224 unit development uh, just outside of Detroit. The, um, I'm gonna jump in and I'm here with Danny Baidun, who is our Director of Investor Relations. And I'm gonna go through our presentation pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Danny's gonna talk about some numbers and we'll be glad to answer any questions and then meet with you guys later to talk about our this uh, exciting uh, investment opportunity. Um, I really went over the executive summary just now, where we're at. So we've been uh, we've been doing development in uh, for a little over four years. We have four projects right now. Um, in uh, right now, it's about uh, 600 doors. We have on the slate to do another three projects in the next two years to get the total count up to about a thousand doors. The um, leadership team. Next slide. You know, you hear this a lot about people being a certain business. We have a combined staff or leadership team that has over 80 years of experience in real estate. And I don't, I don't, you know, take that seriously because most of us are over 60 or 55. So we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, we currently oversee somewhere around $240 million in investment funds for our clients. Uh, and that's across the spectrum of single family, we single family residence uh, portfolios and also in the senior development. The next slide. How we differ. Um, we put everything under the Brookwood umbrella. So our every from from the acquisition team to the uh, the uh, group that goes out and gets the approvals from the cities, and the construction, the management, everything is under the Brookwood umbrella. That allows us total control of this 
um, project from start to finish and then ongoing. Um, what we're offering here with the Brookwood Fenton Regulation A plus raise is the ability for investors to come in at the development level and then get that high that high return when we exit in three to five years. Next slide. So why are we doing this? And it's all about the market opportunity. So you've seen this before. Everybody, I'm sure, I mean, I can say raise your hand, but we all know that we're all getting older and the population is getting older and the demand for senior uh, uh, active lifestyle living is growing. And why Michigan is because Thankfully, well, I've been a Michigander for my whole life, but we're not seeing a whole lot of Michiganders leave doing the snowbird trek down to Florida, down to Arizona, because it's too expensive and they want to stay closer to their families. So what we identified through our vast experience in real estate in the market about five years ago is there hasn't been a lot of new construction builds in the active senior communities. And we identified the population growth that is happening. And like I said in the video, this is actually a study out of University of Michigan. In Michigan, it's the number is 23% of the population in the state of Michigan will be over the age of 60 by 2030. And that's a huge demographics that we're putting ourselves in front of. Next slide. This just reinforces what I just said on the senior and uh, living market trends. And this is from different studies from all over the country but it's the same in Michigan, it's the same in Midwest, it's everywhere. There's demographics of this opportunity are very, very strong. Next slide. And this is our primary development. It's a little overview on Brookwood Fenton. Um, it's right outside of uh, Detroit area. It's north west of Detroit. It's in a very quaint area surrounded by lakes. Uh, it's a rolling development, has a uh, nice topographical area the hills and the uh it's in a nice community medicals shopping everything is there to support this project and hopefully i just decided that you might not be able to hear me does everybody hear me okay okay thanks uh next slide so as an investor we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty here in regards to return of expectations and the project phase timelines this is not a pipe dream uh, investment opportunity. It's shovel ready, meaning that we have full approval from the township, from the city, from the from the county, and we've actually started infrastructure development. We've done all the land balancing, all the grading, and we started laying pipe for the water and sewer systems. We had to stop because it snows in Michigan <laughs> and it gets cold. So we have to, everybody, everything stops until probably March, but we are, we are, this project is in process. It's moving forward. It's not something that we just wrote down on the back of a napkin. And in the Taylor, our Taylor project is already in construction. And we just received final approval for a Brookwood Superior project, which is bigger than this. And we'll be starting that in the summer of this year. And this is a, talks about the, our development uh, process snapshot. So, and I will announce today that we're complete with phase one and we just made a major milestone in phase two. I just got off a conference call uh, with 14 <laughs> HUD uh, employees from the Chicago office. Uh, we are pursuing a HUD backed loan under their multifamily senior um, mandate. Basically they've been mandated to go out and fund these, look for these projects and fund them. Um, we, the call was very successful. We are moving on to the next phase. What that gets us is a construction loan and a financing loan at 5.82%, <laughs> which for the return to our investors is gonna be dramatic. Instead of paying eight, eight and a half, which we all know what money costs right now, this HUD back loan will allow us to achieve and go beyond what you're gonna see from Danny here in a minute in regards to our ROI and our IRR returns. Now, before I, next slide. Before I hand this off to Danny, who's gonna go through these numbers in the financial model, I just wanna stress that we are fully approved regulation A plus raise, meaning that every investment has to go through a broker dealer and we have to do all the reporting to the SEC and fully audited books and transparency. So your investment will be protected when you come, with, come in with us. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. 
So unlike Chris, who can boast about not having the same code on during the video, I can't really say that. So got the same one. <laughs> but um, yeah, so really, really exciting stuff here. And I'm not going to deep dive too much into the numbers right now. We can do that after the fact. We have a full prospectus. So we could spend five hours on the numbers if you guys wish. Just trying to give you guys a quick and dirty high level on this. Um, so on the source of funds, the total project cost is approximately a close to $75 million. Uh, we're looking at about a 65% LTC loan to cost or loan to value, depending on how you want to skin that cat. I like cats. Um, on the equity side, it's close to, we have the regulation A tier two approved for 30 million. We're approximating closer to 28 million, but we have a little bit of a buffer there with a total uh, value of about $74 million total cost of investment in the project. And breaking that down a little bit of use of proceeds, um, you see there on the 56 million 700 and change, um, that's you know earthwork, land acquisition, marketing, you go to the counterclockwise, about $9 million uh, land acquisition, construction cost, and it breaks down from marketing, offering expense, contingency, general contracting cost, development fees, all in about seven, just shy of $75 million. Um, and then it's got a very respectable uh, rate of return ROR and ROI of an annualized 10 to 16% on the ROR and uh, close to 26% uh, on the ROI. And that's annualized. So commensurate to the exit, that's year over year, you're going to get all that money on the exit. And then last, but definitely not least. So this is, you know, like any other uh, investment of this, uh, this sort, it's a fund. So there's a holding period. But while you're in that holding period mode, you're going to receive some preferred passive income of a minimum of 8%. So then commensurate to it being a more profitable that we anticipate conservatively, it's gonna be more of a blended 10 to 14% commensurate to stabilization. That means we have to be renting these. This is a build to rent business model. We're not selling them. So we're only gonna sell on the exit to a larger institution, the entire portfolios. So a blended rate of more like 10 to 14% will be paying out stable, uh, commensurate to stabilization on the, uh, on the project. Shane just said we are close to wrapping. Oh, so okay. So, yeah, um, okay. sir, we have a yeah. whole lot to go through, uh, but we're just touching on it. So. Sorry, yes. Uh, what was harder than uh, making it here? On yeah, so if there's, uh, we have about three or four minutes, so let's go Q&A. If anybody's got any questions. Um, none? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll start from our panel. So um, Gary's going to go ahead and start Sorry. us off. I was looking at uh, the numbers here. I saw you talk about an IRR of 16 to 21%. Given that NASDAQ is doing 15%, that's better than NASDAQ. Good. And it's equity, uh, you know, hard hard money, uh, hard money back, hard asset back. Sorry. What is this 8% preferred pass? Is that on top of the 16 to 21%? Yeah, great question. The, six, the IRR, ROI, yeah, the IRR and ROI is commensurate to the exit. The 8% is the, uh, call it for lack of a better term, profit distribution. So once, this is a rental business model built to rent. So that's an annual That's 8%. an annual commensurate to stabilization, which by 2025, we anticipate stabilization of the project. And then it'll start paying minimum of eight. Anything above eight is a 70-30 split, 70 to the investors, 30 to the principals. So a blended rate at about 10 to 14%. Well, thank you for your presentation. Um, so it's certainly wonderful to have, uh, you know, this kind of community for seniors. Now, I don't know your market very well. Could you just kind of share with the audience um, in the sort of like your general area, what kind of occupancy rate do you see for comparable communities yes. like this? Great question. So before we even started this project, uh, we hired a third party company called Promatura. Promatura did a feasibility analysis for us. So we didn't buy the land just because it was a great deal. It, though it was a good deal, but it's most importantly, is it viable? Is it feasible based on a SWOT analysis, the whole nine yards? So in our primary market area, the PMA, about 10 to 50 mile PMA, there is no other independent senior living project around us. Um, the, the median income in that area is over well over eighty three dollars to $88,000 median income. It's a beautiful little township. Uh, three miles away is the downtown. A half mile away is Lake Fenton. Uh, it's a beautiful area. And yeah. Yeah. Danny, I'll answer your question. So HUD came in and did a study for us in order to take it, take it to the next level. They anticipate in the next three years that there's a demand for 448 units. We're filling half of it. 
okay. in that market. That's it. Great, great. Good spot. That's short answer. Yeah. So <laughs> how, how much, just quick follow up, how much do you price into or, or, or factor into your budget in terms of like, you know, cost overrun and all that stuff? You know, life sometimes is unpredictable, right? Yes. We call this uh, contingency uh, cost. Let me see if I have it on here at all. Roughly 10% on the construction. Yes. I was, I was, and that's from our past experience with uh, with our staff. Yeah, I was going to show you in dollars, but the 10% is the, it's a percentage. Yeah. So first of all, I think the video was a little bit dodgy, but it was actually very compelling. It was a beautiful project. It's really something people can really, I think, um, enjoy looking at and see themselves there. I think a lot of your answers to questions were questions that we all had as a panel. So I would encourage you to anticipate those a little bit better and sort of get right up front with the numbers and, you know, the cap rate, the internal rate of return. Real estate just kind of gets down to what the project is, how much it sort of breaks down into getting into all the demand that you're talking about. So the major question you answered for me was, where is it going to be? Because you, if you're having investors from, Texas, Dallas, Houston, and Austin, you know, it. you might have to be beyond Buddha here in Austin to get anywhere near uh, a land price that works for this. And so you have to really anticipate those points. And so then you kind of get to the the numbers finally, and I think those should be more prominent. So you would want to dive into that as an investor, but the concept is really solid. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, it is. And we do have all those numbers. We just didn't get to it fast enough, so you're correct. <laughs> yes. I have another question about numbers. So is this the only raise you anticipate or what's the predict projected runway for this? Um, this is a $30 million raise on this particular project. We do have a family of three other within the Brookwood estate portfolio. So we'll be doing subsequent raises commensurate to this one being completed. Yes. But under the reg A stipulation, we have, they're all separate. They're all separate, yes. Sorry. We'll be around after. If anyone would like to chat, we're here. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much, uh, Brookwood. Yeah, great job. Um, let's move on to our next presenter, uh, Dry Saber. That's going to be Jack. Uh, oh, here we go. Got a lot of mic choreo going on here. All right, I'm going to be uh, presenting a product that both is a security product as well as an energy saving product, and it's a Lint Alert app. Okay, next slide. Okay, before getting into the problem, I think we need to know the current situation. The National Fire Protection Agency states that every year, there's, there's 90 million dryers in the United States, every year is about 15 deaths. 400 injuries and 200 million in property damage, which is pretty much understated because your average appliance repair guy will go in there, repair a dryer motor, and they're not the homeowner's not going to uh, file a claim because they don't want their insurance to go up. Probably a half a billion dollars in property damage. Okay. So warnings of flammable lint buildup verified by anything, anybody from the uh, National Fire Protection Association, all the insurance companies, if you go online, you're going to see all state, state farm, uh, consumer reports. Everybody's talking about flammable lint buildup. You can look up Martha Stewart or Bob Villa, and they're going to have something on their uh, websites. Okay. So the problem, highly flammable lint buildup and clogs inside the dryer and exhaust vents kill, destroy property and waste energy, which we'll get into in a little bit. But you look under the cause I mean, lint buildup is everywhere from, it starts from inside the dryer. Uh, there's crimp vents when you push the dryer back against the wall, you're gonna crimp and lint's gonna, lint's gonna build up there. Inside the exhaust hoses, all the way up to the roof. We engineer our product so that the detects lint buildup all the way up to a, if you have a dryer in a two-story home in the basement, it will detect it up to 90 feet away. Results, dryers run longer, <clears throat> excuse me, hotter and harder. And as a consequence, they start on fire, the motor starts on fire or burns the house, okay? Solution, earth detection lint alert apps. It alerts homeowners and property managers of highly flammable lint buildup right before it starts overheating the dryer and wasting uh, electricity. So it detects the restricted airflow up to 90 feet away. 
how it works is pretty simple. Number one, there's a uh, device that monitors. It simply twists on the back of a dryer. It's, you know, the dryers all have four inch diameter exhaust vents. So this is universally designed to fit all 100% of them. And you twist the uh, vent on, and then it sends an alert to the board, the PCB board, about the building up of lint right before it starts working harder. And then it notifies either a property manager, a homeowner, or a contractor. And then it prompts the uh, contractor or the homeowner, hey, you better clean out your vent before it starts uh, working longer. In fact, the product was invented by a partner who uh, has been in the appliance repair business. 90% of his calls on dryers, he does ovens and everything else, is by dryers taking too long to dry. Well, he goes over there, pulls the dryer out, and pulls out a big clump of lint. And that's what happens. And invariably, the motor's already burnt out. Okay, next slide. So simple app-directed DIY installation. Everybody installs now. They kind of got away with uh, inserting its, uh, installation instructions. Basically, you twist it on the back of the dryer. You put the vent hose on the opposite side of the uh, sensor, which I've got a sample here. And then it connects to the uh, adapter, plug it in, and then you download and uh, uh, register your app. Energy savings. This is another huge uh, attribute because dryers, once they hit a certain point where they start uh, running longer and harder and hotter, the amount of energy accelerates potentially going up. And that's where most of these uh, fires that burn out, you know, a lot of homeowners, it kind of sneaks up on you. If your dryer is set to run 35 or 40 minutes, once it starts burning up energy, it sneaks up all of a sudden the homeowner says, well, you know, it's like 50, 60 minutes. My dryer is taking too long to dry. And then they don't know anything about this. So they'll call the contractor up and appliance repair guy. He'll come out and he'll pull out all the lint. And by then they've already burned 40% more energy over maybe four, five, six months. So, so obviously less energy usage, less carbon footprint. In fact, one of these days I'm going to take the 90 million dryers and, and uh, figure out how much impact it would have on the carbon footprint if everybody had a uh, dry safer. Okay. So as far as competition, there's a product out there called Lint Alert, but the big takeaways on there, if you look on the left, uh, Dry Safer, we have all these attributes, do-it-yourself installation. Theirs requires a contractor actually to drill a hole into the exhaust vent to monitor their air pressure. And the big takeaways on the lower left, uh, we capture, we're going to talk about in a minute, is data capturing, uh, which allows, and because it's a do-it-yourself item, getting into Home Depot and Lowe's, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's buyers will not put the lint alert in because they will get a lot of returns. And then it also allows us to get into the uh, property manager channel. Okay. If you look at the, I won't go into a lot of this, but this is what the lint alert installation manual looks like. And if you look at the middle, all those tappings you have to put in, nobody's going to want to put in those tappings and drill in a hole. Okay. Marketing and sales. What's great about this product is that to reach the 90 million dryers, we're going to be able to partner up with a whole diversified uh, number of channels. We got the home security systems such as ADT. Uh, all the property managers like Graystar has got seven, eight hundred thousand units. Uh, the Home Depots of the world, QVC. I mean, everybody uh, is going to be involved with putting this in because they're already calling on these companies with their uh, security systems. So our first wave is B two B to Z. We're going to have a Z Wave app that the ADTs of the world and Honeywell's, the fellows, we've got two guys that are kind of gurus in the home security business. They've been involved since the uh, advent of home security. They work with Honeywell. They can walk in the offices of ADT, present our, our app. Uh, and once we get to that part, then we've got a Wi-Fi uh, app that we'll show you a demo later on. And that one will allow us to get into the uh, B2C channels of the Home Depot, Lowe's, Best Buys of the world. And then the next will be monetization, which is huge. And that'll take us to the next slide. Okay, we've got in our software a patented data capture monetization where we can go into the property managers. The big thing with property managers in a lot of states, every two years they got to clean out their vents, whether they need it or not. So if you got 400 departments in a building, he's got to get these contractors to pull out the dryer, pull out the exhaust hose, and see if there's lint in there. Well, there may only be 20, 25% that have lint buildup because the tenants could be a, uh, a young couple that wash their clothes four or five times a week, as opposed to somebody that a family 
that's washing them three times a night because their kids are playing soccer or whatever. So what a lot of the property managers do is on the when they get an app on their desktop, they'll say, geez, you know, apartment 220 needs to be cleaned out. And maybe every month there might be half a dozen of them. They'll call a contractor and say, you know what, go ahead and clean these out. And instead of cleaning out 400, maybe they'll only clean out 50. And they've been the ones that have been telling us they're waiting, waiting to get their hands on this. And then also on the app data collection, imagine if you're a Samsung or a GE and even a, a property manager or a, a appliance repair company, they have the demographics that of your customers. For instance, like we get our, our uh, grass, uh, we have a uh, weed cleaning company or whatever that sprays the grass and they know what kind of grass it is, if it's under shade, under uh, uh, under sun, et cetera. And so they can kind of formulate their, their uh, formula. The same thing with, uh, if you're with a appliance repair company and you've got on your data, your 500 customers, you're gonna know when they need to have their vent clean out. So you can call them and say, hey, look, you need to get your vent clean out. I'll be, when can we schedule an appointment? It's gonna be huge. Next. So a forecast. You know, there's 90 million dryers out there. Everybody says, well, if you go for 5% market penetration, you're looking at four and a half million dryers times 75, 80 bucks. It's a $350 million company in four and a half years. And uh, we can, buy, what, what we're looking at is a half a percent or 450,000 dryers. Now, if you look at the bottom there, if we get into like an ADT has 6 million customers, even if they put 10% in, uh, their customer base, that's 600,000 units. That kind of blows away the 450,000. But we'd rather like under promise and over perform. So it's fairly conservative, uh, obviously a forecast. Okay, next slide. So as far as how we're gonna go to market on this, I've been involved with companies over $150 million. I've managed $14 million ad budget, introduced over 300 million in products. Uh, Tom Asciola, my partner and inventor uh, has owned a successful appliance repair business. He does about 10,000 vent cleanouts a month. That's just a month. And there's thousands of companies just like him. It's a big business. There's companies that do nothing but do vent cleanouts. It's low capital. All you got to do is get a couple of uh, uh, hose, uh, leaf blowers and you go in there and you blow out the lint and these guys are making tons of money. And then Randy Russell, who's a guru in uh, resin technology is a manufacturer. He's got, uh, he's got a, a million unit contract to produce a million elbow pads and a million knee pads for the US uh, military. And he just knows everything about resins. He produced the first three generations of our product. Next. And then the two fellows, uh, Abby Rosenthal and Mike uh, Buckingham, they've been in this business forever. Uh, Avi knows all the board manufacturers, the keyboard manufacturers. He actually does business with a lot of them. Uh, he said, hey, Jack, why don't we produce something in Mexico? We're looking at Mexico and we've got quotes in Taiwan. Uh, and then Mike was involved with the Yale lock, uh, smart lock, and he's been involved with home security as well. So of the five of us, I know we were looking at the number of years. We're a bunch of old guys over 150 years combined. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and we know everything, every part of the business model. I mean, manufacturing, cost improvement, you know, the whole works. In the next slide. So we're looking at, uh, seems like a lot less than what you guys are looking at. $600,000 at a buck 25 a share, tranches of 15,000. And uh, right now we've got three and a half, 3.7 million in shares outstanding. And it would bring uh, up to 4,150,000. Uh, that uh, comes out to about 480,000 shares or about 11% uh, equity. And we, uh, out of our own savings, have put in over 200,000 bucks. So it's been a kind of a long haul, but we've gone through a really uh, process of, of uh, deliberate process of going through each of the first three generations. In fact, if you wanna go through a couple of slides later, I just wanna show you something which is a little detailed, uh, a couple more. Uh, one after, uh, okay, well, there's the use of proceeds. You know, we've got about out of the 600,000, you can look at 100,000 in uh, developing the Z-Wave. We already paid for, by the way, the Wi-Fi model. We'll show you an app real quick. And then another 200,000 in marketing and business spent, and then 300,000 or okay. half of it uh, into inventory. You ready to get into some questions? Sorry, we're just running a little bit uh, on time here. Pardon? Are you ready to get into some yeah. questions? 
Cool. Um, let's just pass it over to the panel. Um, get it started. Who would like to start for us? Start with our panel, and then if we can get over to you, we definitely will. This question may be better than mine. So I'm allergic to dust and also mountain cedar, so I'm very much behind the behind okay. the product. So the only thing I don't really like, to be honest with you, okay. is that it really doesn't have a direct consumer, like online model that I could figure out from there. And I worry about if you're staking the future of the company on a Home Depot. Hold on a second. Did I miss that? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, Home I Depot. Got in, but okay. So you don't. We don't have what? Well, I mean, all of your backgrounds are yeah. dealing with really big. Uh, indirect or channel sales and those are great except they take a long time mm -hmm. they cost a lot and you're always at the women fancy of a big channel partner like if you get in home depot like if you get in walmart walmart can kill you as well as help you mm -hmm. so you have to really watch so i think you'd be better off starting with the direct to consumer and mm -hmm. using that to undergird your channel marketing program just mm -hmm. as i see that but the i think it's analogous to really creating the same demand as a fire protection unit mm -hmm. when they started out in houses no one really knew what those were either right. so i think if you kind of model after what they're doing i think it really kind of launches your marketing everything else looks really i mean it's a great product um maybe mm -hmm. cost to be competitive but okay you know that's the only thing i would like to see as an you investment. want to go to the uh, exit strategy slide it's good input we've sold uh in one day we sold 1250 units uh, on homedepot.com and and we've got uh, the reps that we have I've known for 25 years they're former buyers and all the reps that we hire we want to make sure they're former buyers so the uh, our Home Depot uh, rep Paul uh, Brennan has worked for Home Depot for 20 years before he started his own agency and these guys have great relationships uh, two more up on the exit strategy any okay next but good input yeah so following on that question um I understand the 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 market size, 90 million units. Got it. That was clear. How many units did you sell last year? Last year? Well, okay. Good or, question. or the year before that or year yeah. before that. And we any sold of the last probably year. uh the first generation, which was trying to prove out the concept, sold maybe fifteen hundred units because we wanted to get in to see what the input was. It's more of a test marketing. Next uh sec second generation about 5,000 units because we tested it out with a home improvement center, Menards. Third generation, we were in 400 stores with Lowe's and now with fourth generation with the app. And we found that with the, the, the challenge with retailers are you're at the mercy of the execution of the store manager. You know, like with Lowe's, the buyer said, hey, Jack, I'm going to put it in the front where, you know, you get the orders for a dryer or washing machine. And every one of our guys are going to say, oh, by the way, you want an 18-month uh, uh, interest-free program? Or do you want a warranty? And oh, by the way, you ought to buy a dry safer. No, well, that didn't happen because execution. Whereas going with the ADTs of the world, they've already got the customers and they can just add it onto their installation. Yeah, I, I guess my thinking or question here is there's a there's a market opportunity of 90 million, but that's your view of this market opportunity. But the demand seems like it's much, much lower. And and the issue I think is education, right? So they don't know they need this product. So gotcha. I've owned I don't know how many houses and I don't know how many dryers, um, and I have no idea the amount of lint buildup they've had. I can right. imagine it's an issue, um, but every time I've had to work on the damn thing, um, it doesn't seem like it's a problem. Well, that's a that's a good question. And again, that all comes back to the business yeah. development end of it, with social media, and getting the the PR and getting the awareness of it, uh, just like any other product you know exactly the word and, and so if i was going to give you one piece of advice on this discussion is you need to have a slide of how you're going to educate and create demand it's really about demand creation for yeah. you it's really all about demand creation right. and and i think you're trying to find ways around doing that by using adt and other forums or other right. distributors but that's going to be the problem for you or them yeah. Is like, how do you create demand for this opportunity? And we thought about that. A good question is when we partner with, say, an ADT or a, a uh, these home insurance companies and they put it on there, uh, like Home Depot, for instance, gets 10 million hits a week at Amazon. Once we get partnerships with those those companies, they'll put it on their website with theirs and we'll piggyback on their expenditure, their ad spun, uh, funds. So, you know, we'll have some too, but it's going to be getting with them, the partnerships with the Honeywells of the world and the Vivants, 
and then they'll be pushing it. Sure. Um, so very quickly, uh, what kind of gross margin are we talking about? And then, what kind of gross margin are we talking about? 55%. Okay. And just curious, why is it that you can, um, for this offering, you do a common stock offering as opposed to prefer stock? Um, it's actually quite unusual for this stage of the company. Uh, I, there might be a good reason for it. Just curious. Well, we just want to get somebody interested in getting equity. And with preferred stock, then we have to get into uh, the interest buildup. Uh, and we have to say, okay, you're going to get X amount back. We're looking at about a uh, five percent, uh, five times earnings on a uh, per share. So we just found that just doing a straight equity deal would be more enticing to investors. Um, I, I think you can, you, you and I can discuss uh, offline, and I think that uh, it, it may limit some of the uh, in, investor interest. But yeah. uh, okay, good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jack. Um, great job. Take that. All right. And next up, we have Paytrust. Nathaniel, come over and take this away from me. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for listening. So I'm Nathaniel Everhart. I'm the CEO of Paytrust. Our goal is to help consumers pay all of their bills on time, every time. Next slide. Paytrust is a union of two different services. The first is Silver Bills, a concierge bill pay service founded in 2014 by Marcy Lobel Esrig. Uh, I joined in 2019. And Paytrust, a direct to consumer digital bill pay service that was actually founded in 1998, um, was acquired by FIS, um, Fidelity Information Services, which is a $33 billion market capitalized, publicly traded uh, fintech company and has been their direct to consumer arm um, for the past 12 years. They decided for strategic reasons um, to exit the direct to consumer space. One of the biggest reasons for that is because they want to do business with more startups like us. Um, we agreed to purchase on deferred payment terms uh, the Patros brand, customer book, and mail facility, which I'll get to in, in, in a bit and is very important, um, from them in July and built out a digital service over the past six months, which launched on January 3rd of this year. Next slide. So 42% of adults over 50 have difficulty paying um, their bills each month. Many also uh, struggle with managing their mail. Um, just the pile of bills uh, stacking up on a dining room table is a site that greets uh, many people when they go and visit an elderly relative. And the combination of those two problems is what Paytrust is built to solve. Not paying your bill on, bills on time can have huge consequences, which I think can be relatively uh, apparent to anyone who's um, ever just thought about this problem. Obviously, uh, interrupted vital services is a, a hugely significant one, um, but declining credit, um, uh, just the administrative time that it takes to pay bills um, via check or using phone um, bill payment systems is a drain on um, your just free time to spend on other things. So it is an enormous societal problem. Next slide. Uh, we focus mostly on the older adult market, but Bill pay is something that many people struggle with. 72% of consumers are in some sort of the collection process and many struggle. Um, I have a, a whole bunch of reasons there that um, consumers um, report for um, being in that status. And we've built a technology, um, a suite of technology that can both discover um, the collections and bills that you have outstanding and then um, 
work to get those paid off and for um, current obligations paid on time. Next slide. So we have two plans. Um, one, pay trust convenience, which uh, is um, a successor to the former all digital um, pay trust service. Uh, so we have actually built out a um, UX ourselves um, for that. Uh, one thing that sets us apart from any other um, bill pay service on the market, including um, Rocket Money, which is a, a big name you, you might have heard of, is that we do provide both an at paytrust.com email address and a physical mailbox to which all bill pay correspondents can be directed. And that um, mail facility um, came with the uh, Paytrust acquisition and is located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For Paytrust Concierge, um, we offer the same suite of digital tools as we do for Paytrust Convenience, but also we include a US-based account manager uh, who a user can reach by phone anytime. Um, you can interact with us for uh, the concierge business entirely over the phone and through the U.S. mail. No digital literacy, computer use, or even smartphone use is required. So between those two services, we can basically help anyone, um, whether they want a convenient online digital experience or a full service account manager mediated service. Next slide. So our three pillars um, of, of service are um, just for the, the concierge business, um, we do have that um, personalized support. Um, for both, we have that all-in-one um, single platform for all of your bills, including those that come in by mail, um, those that come in by e email, and those that um, you upload to the app. Um, and then additionally, we have... Um, security tools for fraud protection, for um, identity protection, and a full suite of rep reporting capabilities. Next slide. So Paytrust today has 4,000 um, users and a database which we have yet to market to at all of 124,000 former users um, of the Paytrust platform. Our ARR is $1.2 million as of this month and $1.4 billion has been spent through the program over the last 24 months. Um, for the Patros convenience plan, the average user pays $21.14. It's just over $130 for the uh, Patros concierge. Next slide. Our bill pay engine uh, has at its core FIS's flagship Fusion product. On top of that, we have built our own AI-enabled um, engine for scanning um, bills, whether they come in through the mailbox, by email, or by upload um, through our app. You can just take a picture and upload it. And we allow payment out from any bank account um, that you want, uh, up to 10. We also support um, Zelle and Card as well. Next slide. Um, so the marketplace has shifted even in the past um, six months significantly. There are a number of free services, including Mint, um, Fiserv's My Check Free service, all of which have been shut down. So there are a huge number of um, people who used to get a free service that is no longer available. And there are also many people who use a professional service, an accountant or what's called a, a daily money manager to pay their bills but who do so in a relatively um, inefficient um, manner. Um, our account managers are, this is all they do. So compared to using your accountant uh, to handle your bills, which many uh, wealthy older adults do, our service can do it at a much better price and with a full suite of digital um, security behind us. We do have um, a SOC 2 certification and a HIPAA certification showing our data protection capabilities. Next slide. It's a huge market opportunity. The amount that consumers um, are costed by late payments and um, credit charges for non-payment are enormous. Next slide. 
and we have uh, really great partners to help distribute um, our product. FIS, obviously, from both a technology perspective, um, is really vital. They're also going to help us distribute through the banks that they deal with. We have achieved um, two uh, SBIR grants for from the National Institutes of Health, totaling $4.4 million. The first um, piloting our a service to caregivers for patients with Alzheimer's disease, and the second focused on LGBTQ plus older adults. We also have contracts with um, Humana already in place and um, United uh, Healthcare as well. Next slide. Our gross margins are um, relatively um, healthy. Um, obviously, we, we'd like to um, get them above that, that current, just about 20%. We're confident that further automation and economies of scale as we grow will allow us to do that. Next slide. Our growth, um, especially uh, through this um, Patris acquisition, has been um, pretty incredible over the past um, 18 months or so. Um, we do, I mentioned that, that ARR number of 1.2 at the present time and 4,000 clients on the service. Next slide. We do expect um, really massive growth over the next few years. Um, the starting point of that is going to be these former um, Paytrust users who we're going to be marketing to, um, expanding the partnerships that we have uh, with those insurers, and especially guardianship groups, um, which is a huge industry in the United States. They pay bills for millions uh, of Americans, but there really isn't a service available to today that um, is specifically uh, targeted towards them and makes the specific bill pay process really easy. Next slide. So we are um, looking for $4 million. Um, the majority of, well, a plurality of that going to marketing our service. We uh, have still have a lot of work to do on the technology side. Um, building out further AI-enabled tools for financial advice, um, smarter alerts, and a number um, of other things. We have a relatively uh, modest um, overhead level, um, and we're confident uh, with this new dual um, product set that we can grow quickly. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, can take any questions. Great. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, who wants to start us off on the panel? Pass it over to you. Thanks for a presentation. Um, so yeah, helping consumers to pay their bills certainly is um, is a very, it, it's it's a tall order, uh, but it's great that you're attempting that. Just curious, um, so one of the slides that you show, um, you have currently 4,000 um, users and you've been around for business for 25 years. Um, and there are, former customers of 124,000. So what are the, did you guys do any research as to what could help you, you know, like keep these customers? It, it seems like there's uh, quite a bit of churn there. Oh, mo most certainly. Um, so the direct to consumer business was not a, a huge focus of FIS. They did not spend a lot of time on, on pay trust mm -hmm. and there are a significant number of users who, who did leave. Uh, we have built an entirely new um, digital program. We have an entirely new customer service organization, and we're confident that we can bring um, a lot of those um, customers back. If, if you read some of the um, online reviews, you know, you'll see that it, it was before it was acquired, a really beloved um, service. And we're working basically to bring it back to the place that it was with our own internal tech team and a bunch of new um, skills that that we're bringing to the table. But Silverbills and the organization that that I lead was founded um, in 2014, and we've been growing slowly but surely that concierge business ever since. Mm -hmm. That's great. And um, it, it sounds like the average customer tenure is about 20 years. So there's something happened. Um, at some point that make them a little bit not very happy? And has anything changed to help you sort of be confident about getting them back? Could you go a little bit deeper? Sure. Um, so really, uh, 
the biggest thing is just a more modern um, software experience. And I'm, I'm happy for anyone here to give a demo um, of our web and mobile app. The, there actually was no mobile app um, at all um, for, for the service. And also it was just a, uh, a relatively antiquated um, piece of technology that, that had not been updated since 2012. So that, that, that's the biggest single reason why white people left. So love the idea. I'm sure my children are planning to use something like this with me. Um, a couple of questions along, probably along the same lines. One is you showed the 4,000 users. What is the average number of bills per user per month? Um, it is 12. Huh. More than I would have guessed. All right. And, and the second thing is, as an investor, this is half of the data I need to start, right? You want four, four mil. I get that. What is your pre-money valuation? Oh, sorry. Uh, next, ne next slide. It's uh, t 12. Okay. That's an important little data point. Yes. Got it. All right. Uh, good. Now I can uh, evaluate that. Um, I would say you should talk to me after this. So, sorry, say again? You should talk to me after this. Oh, great. I'd love to. So I applaud you for working and getting that from FIS because I've known that company for a long time. That's a great achievement to get that. I think you also need to explain why they dumped it because that's what they did to let you pick it up. But it's, it's sort of indigenous with the whole area of online bill pay. No one really has it quite down because it's hard to um, implement it. It's hard to aggregate customers. And it's really a messy customer experience. It is. So you have to figure that out. Um, I would like like the good comments on the, the numbers and the valuation. Uh, I'd like to know the cost. I mean, this is really a... Um, like the online con or the concierge aspect of it could work for more than just geriatrics, but I think it's um, you have to marry that over with it. So I think it's um, all in all, you're about 80% there on kind of putting the package together. So uh, a lot of it is really great. So it's good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Yep, steal this one too. Sorry, I gotta be the mic guy. Yeah, great job. Uh, next, I wanna bring up Windmill. Um, Sam, oh, there you are. Oh, if, yeah, if you wanna, oh, stress. Thank you. Go ahead and give this off to you and get started whenever you're ready. Or whenever we get the presentation. Get the slides up. Yes. While we're getting uh, waiting for the slides to come up, my name is uh, Sam Liang, and I'm pleased to present on behalf of Dr. Richard Smalling, who's the CEO of Windmill. He's a full-time practicing cardiologist, uh, thought leader in structural heart, and he's uh, seeing patients today, as one would uh, expect. Uh, he co-found he founded Windmill um, several years ago. And um, Windmill is developing a transformational, what's called left ventricular assist device, an LVAD, for end-stage patients who have heart failure. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Sorry about that. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry, we are working on it as we speak. I've never had two screens in my life, so. Also, please enjoy this picture of me eating a donut with one of my friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so um, I, I have um, about 39 years of healthcare experience, uh, mostly with companies Johnson & Johnson, Bayer Healthcare, and what brought me to Austin is, is uh, hanger orthotics and prosthetics. But uh, prior to that, my years at J&J &J was running uh, the cardiovascular stent franchise, 
And uh, Dr. Richard Smalling at the time still is, was a thought leader in interventional cardiology. And he's now a thought leader in structural heart. Um, and so I retired <clears throat> from Hangar in 2020. And just as, as you would know, just um, started looking at this area of heart failure. My daughter actually worked for Medtronic um, who was in the heart failure space. And she told me about this company. So I said, let me just drop by. And that's how I got involved uh, with the company. And then since then I've joined as an operating partner with the Revival Healthcare Capital. Uh, which also um, likes the likes the company. It's just a little bit too early for our investment thesis right now. Okay, so with that, um, as I mentioned, uh, we're talking about windmill. Uh, they've developed a transformational LVAD, and uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the unmet need is the unmet need that we're addressing is the six million patients in the U.S. healthcare system that have heart failure. A tremendous cost. To it, there's a subset of these patients that are an end-stage heart failure, about 50,000 uh, patients. And um, due to the lack of hearts, these patients either get a heart transplant or they get an LVAD. And due to the lack of hearts, as well as their shortcomings in the technology and innovation in the LVAD space, um, the penetration rate is very, very low. So there's over 40,000 patients that end up just getting some type of palliative care and they just end up in the hospital and they're hooked up to a machine and they just end up dying. Very, a very, very terrible uh, life. The reason why there is such limited adoption in the LVAD space is that today there's only one device on the market and it's the Abbott HeartMate 3. And the Abbott HeartMate 3 technology operates on what's called an impeller design. It's a blender that essentially spins at a very high rate and it pulls blood into the heart. The issue with these impeller type designs is that they damage the blood, specifically something that's called von Willebrand factor. There's a lot of science around damage of von Willebrand factor and when that causes um, downstream events, which as a result, you can see on the right hand side, these are real world registries of patients uh, with the HeartMate 3, and, and, um, and you can see that there's well over a 33%, one third of the patients get um, GI bleeding, stroke, and about 90% of these patients go back into the hospital. And that's what's driving a lot of these healthcare um, costs and events. So it's Windmill's mission to actually change uh, this for patients worldwide. Next slide, please. So the design, uh, what Dr. Smalling, um, and this colleague said, this is a spin out out of the University of Texas. It's their IP. It's licensed uh, from the UT um, uh, scientists. Basically, it's two ceramic cylinders encased uh, in a uh, titanium case. And basically it pumps, as you can see, like a heart. You can also see that it's got an EKG sensing lead that's attached you know, to the outside of the heart. And with this, it's really essentially a smart pump. It has AI sensing rhythm so that as your activity ramps up, you're walking, you're playing with your kids, it pumps faster. And as you slow down and sit down, it goes slower. Because it's pit, the piston is, is pumping in a pulsatile fashion, there's two advantages. One, it's very gentle. It doesn't damage blood. There's a lot of animal studies that the company has done to show how it does not damage the von Willebrand factor compared, especially on benchtop, compared to the HeartMate uh, 3. And then because it's pumping pulsatile, it's not on all the time, it draws a lot less current and wattage. And because of that, the battery requirements are very, very small. And you can just see up here um, how the system is very, very small and compact, the Torvad compared to the HeartMate 3. It's about a third of the size. The uh, HeartMate 3 is about six pounds. And I'll show you a schematic. The patient wears it like you know gun holsters. And with the Torvad, it has the ability just to have one very small battery pack. If you go to the next slide. So this is a side-by-side -side, um, um, showing the system side-by-side. -side. And look, Torvad's on the right, and you can see how it's pumping in the red, the pulsatility. And you can look at the monitor. You see it's 80 uh, beats per minute and 2.5 flow. So what happens is, as the patient's increasing his activity, like he's walking, playing with his kids, 80, 90, 100 beats per minute, you notice the Torvad is pumping much harder, much faster. And then notice as the patient sits down, 
80, 90, it slows down. So this is accomplished by, there's actually a lead, epicardial lead that goes from the Torvad on the right-hand side. You can see it's, we just put it on the outside of a, of a, of a, of a um, simulated heart. So again, it's, 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 it's um, simulating the heart in terms of uh, matching what's going on with, with the patient. On the left-hand side is the HeartMate 3. And what you can notice around the HeartMate 3 besides the size is you can see it's just constantly churning at a constant flow rate. So you can just see how, how that column of water is remaining constant. So regardless of what the patient does, if the patient's trying to exert and walk and play with their kids, it's just pumping blood at the same level, the same flow rate. So as a result, patients, they get very tired, they get dizzy because the heart rate is not pumping. It, there's no uh, smart sensing or feedback mechanism going to the Abbott HeartMate 3. Um, likewise, if you're sitting down, patients will say it's over pumping and they feel flushed and sometimes they will have headaches. The very last thing I wanted to um, um, point out is if you can look on the Torvad on the right-hand side, you can see these uh, gel, gel beads that are pumping through the heart, through the device. And you can see they're perfectly intact as they're going through it. If you, we've taken the same gel beads and you've put them on the left, on, on the, I guess on the left-hand side through the Abbott uh, HeartMate 3, and you can see they've already chewed them up. This is the effect that we're talking about, the damage that occurs to the blood cells and the von Willebrand factor. This is really what's causing the cascade of all of these adverse events, a stroke, GI bleeds, and, um, so the promise, obviously, the, the value proposition for Torvad, besides being small, being um, physiological synchronous to your activity, it also doesn't damage the von Willebrand factor, which also can reduce all of these adverse events and save patients you know, from going back into the hospital and save healthcare a lot of money. Let me just go to the next slide, please. Actually, you can just go to the next slide. So in summary, as we talk about the HeartMate 3, Blood, you know, continuous flow, blood damage, adverse events, non-responsive to patient activity. And, and because it's so large, many patients just simply say, forget it, I'm just going to, you know, let things go and I'll just wait for a heart transplant. Many of them don't get heart transplants and as a result, they die. Torvad, on the other hand, pulsatile, gentle, responsive to patient activities, very small system, very uh, we anticipate very high patient satisfaction and, and adoption. One other thing I didn't mention is because it's smaller, the doctors can actually implant it through a thoracotomy, which is just through your ribs. You don't have to do a sternotomy and crack the chest. So there's many, many uh, other advantages to it, but I just wanted to hit the high points. Next slide. The company over the last um, um, several years has had a several um, dramatic progress towards uh, achieving clinical trials. They've had three generations of, of designs. Um, the first Torved that we've shown that's here, the second one is one that can be fully implantable. Right now there's a drive line that goes outside, but the next, because it again draws such a small, small amount of, of power, it can be fully implantable. And the third is a smaller device that can fit women and children. The HeartMate 3 today, because it's so large and the, and the accessories, many women and children, it will not um, be able to be used in. Uh, there's a big IP patent estate, lots of animal data that have been done, many publications and presentations uh, globally, um, put together a world-class uh, team as well as um, a heart failure a scientific advisory board. These are all leaders uh, in the field. The company was recognized by ACC, the American College of Cardiology, a couple years ago as the most innovative uh, technology in, in their pitch competition. Next slide, please. When you look at the TAM, today it's about a $6.4 billion total available market in the United States today. Abbott today recognizes uh, on its own, because it's the only product, of $1.1 billion globally. It's a big franchise globally. $600 million is in the market in the U.S., and we've done voice of customer feedback of all of the um, world leading surgeons and transplant folks. And they have just basically said, if I had Torvad, it would become my frontline therapy and it would expand the patient population that I could actually put it in for all the various reasons that I've, I've articulated. So we'd anticipate a growth in the TAM, growth in penetration, and certainly a growth in share uh, versus uh, Abbott. Next slide. Uh, from a financing perspective, um, 
about 15 million has been raised to date. Most of it has been non-dilutive NIH grants, SBIR grants. Companies raising $7 million to hire a full-time CEO. Uh, we've contracted with two really great um, um, regulatory consultants. They are all ex-FDA in the space of LVADs, as well as Valentium down in Houston, contract manufacturers, to finish the product design and to work towards its first uh, uh, protocol. That's what the $7 million financing is. You know, there have been two exits in this market, and uh, one is Abbott uh, St. Jude, and the other one is um, Medtronic acquired Heartwave. They've all been in the billions of dollars. Uh, many of the strategics um, would be interested in this as they have call points in this area. They just would like to see first in human data. And obviously, this is also similar to Heartware. This is an ipo um, a company from an exit perspective. Next slide. And I'll just leave and close with this um, slide that comes from feedback from many of the thought leaders that I've met that I've mentioned. And basically what all of these thought leaders have said is that um, if this product would get to market, it would become their frontline therapy and that there's a number of patients that they could use to expand its utilization. Um, and all of this is really just to benefit patients and in addition have the byproduct of saving the healthcare system globally a lot of money. So thank you very, very much for your time. And uh, I've got some units here afterwards if people want to touch and feel them. Thank you. Awesome. Let's move it into Q&A. She wants to start us off. Sam, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, you're a great uh, spokesperson for the company. Um, so just curious, um, what do you need to do to take it to the market? What do you need to do to take the tour back to market? And in terms of how much money, additional rounds you need to raise and also what kind of FDA approval timeline, et cetera. So in, 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 in short right now, the 7 million will fund the company to the end of 2025, beginning of 2026, really by 17 years. Um, There'll be another 13 million that's required to get the product to a system being called a DFS, so we can still really study in the United States. That would occur in the 2027 time frame. Uh, we have five to 10 patients with success around that, then you would go down to the pivotal product. So mm -hmm. past the seven, another 58 would be raised. These are very capital intensive uh, programs. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So one quick follow up. Um, how so how long can the Torvac stay in your body? Is it like forever till you die, or is it every few years you need to? Yeah. Th this patient population will get a uh, an LVAD. Typically, uh, they're bridged to transplant until they get a heart, and in some cases, uh, they'll be their destination therapy, and typically be five years. Yeah. And, and the, but the company has done a durability testing out to forty years. So, but typically these patients will be five, five years. So I'm going to have to reiterate, if you're not the normal presenter of this, that person might reconsider making you the normal oh. presenter of this. <laughs> Fantastic job. Um, I have to ask the same question I asked with the last person. What is your pre-money valuation? Right now, pre-money valuation is about 18. Well, so right now, the last valuation that the company had was about 18 million. Right. And I saw that on the 409A. Yeah, yeah. And so for this upcoming round, there is no uh, set pre-money pre valuation. The the board, again, of the 18 million, about eight to nine million was was actually non-dilutive capital. So it's a very small cap table of just insiders. Mm -hmm. And they're very willing and very flexible to uh, to talk about it. Recognizing that valuations really haven't changed since 22 years. Uh, recognizing, yes, recognizing it's a very tough funding environment, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yep. That's rational. Very much rational. Unusual. Um, so <laughs> great, great to hear that. Um, I think you also should talk to me after this. Yes, certainly. Be glad to. Yeah, I, I think I'd really talk about the FDA sooner because that's, that's the key. Yes. We've done a few biotech deals. And you look at the, the numbers perfectly understandable with the 7 million, but you have to be careful that it's not just a bridge to nowhere because yeah. you essentially raise the 7 million and you're really not there yet. So what we found is we really latch on to 
a larger pharmaceutical funder or a larger funder in connection with that. And that sort of solves that problem. Not easy to do, but you're right, it's a hard market. But yeah. this is a brilliant project, no question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. for the advice. Does the battery ever need to get changed? Uh, so yes, uh, the batteries do get changed. Uh, so the um, the HeartMate 3 with the two battery packs, they have to recharge it pretty much every day. Um, with the um, Torvad, um, you got about 10, you got about 10 hours with it and you can pull it out and then you can put it back in, put it back in again. So, but the, but the batteries are external, at least in this first generation products and um, pretty much every, every single day um, they need, they need to change them. The difference is you have to change two with the, um, with the Abbott product and with the Torvad, you'd only change one. And both of the both and the, the interesting thing is that so the Torvad actually has a battery um, in it so that if the battery ends up like accidentally dying, there's enough resident charge to keep it going for another hour or two because it draws. It's only pumping every now, you know, like a heart. It's not on all the time. It draws a lot less current. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Great job. Yeah, great job. Uh, next up, we have Pete Ferrari from Global Foods Group. Go ahead and hand this up. Good afternoon, everybody. I feel like I need to bust out a little Sinatra with this mic in my hand. I haven't used one of these before. So my name is Pete Ferrari. I'm the founder of a Global Foods Group doing business as Healthy for Life Foods, which you'll see any moment here. So basically, we're bringing a rare sugar to America, and we've named it Jaka. So the course of the next 10 minutes, we'll describe this rare sugar, some of the merits, and walk through the business plan as well as the model. Maybe I will jump into Fly Me to the Moon while we're chilling time. Again, I apologize. <laughs> Please. Uh, I think that's actually a great question, and, and I think you're going to like the answer. Basically, this is uh, compelling and paradigm shifting because it's actually a sugar. So it's not a sugar alternative. It is a monosaccharide. It's got the same molecular composition as sucrose, the sugar we grew up with, but the molecules affix themselves together differently, which basically changes it from a poison into a superfood. The reason why that's important, and the most important thing to take away from the nine minutes here, is that this is a sugar, so it tastes like sugar. It cooks like sugar. It bakes like sugar. If you've ever had products made with stevia, truvia, sac, they taste like a wad of tinfoil, like you're chewing on a bag of nickels. So this really is a very unique opportunity for us to bring a sugar into this country where there's little or no awareness and really establish ourselves as a thought leader and a dominant brand. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Well, it's, it's an inch. Yeah, if we had the slides up, you'd be getting all these questions answered. So you just keep leading, lead the witness, lead the witness. Yeah, this is interestingly a sugar that was first identified in the 1970s. So it's been around for quite a long time. And it's heavily used in Japan, probably the healthiest culture on the planet, north of 4,000 products. They use this sugar to the extent that we use stevia here in this country. But stevia has now been shown to mutate DNA. The reason is the big food and beverage companies. The reason is naturally the FDA. They've got their own agendas, they've got their own narratives, and they've been able to keep this sugar down primarily because it's not addictive, right? They don't want to bastardize their current supply chains. They want, don't want to re reformulate their recipes. They want to keep the generational clients in place, keep them addicted to sugar, keep pushing product, and keep meeting the street. These companies have known about this sugar for decades. Cargill's got a $4 billion R&D department. So um, they've known about it, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute with about one of our advisors. They just don't really want any part of it. So again, my name is Pete Ferrari, founder of Global Foods Group, Healthy for Life Foods. Next slide, please. Talked about this, sugar is the new cigarette, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, certain cancers, asthma, liver disease, hypertension. It's, it's interesting because while 77% of Americans are trying to reduce their sugar intake, sugar is still preferred four to one, due largely because of taste. So basically that's why you find yourselves with a kager in the sugar market of 8.01%, and the kager for all other sweeteners combined is only 4%. There has not been a remedy for the taste problem. Enter Jaka. Next slide, sir. Jaka is actually a monosaccharide, same molecular composition as sucrose. They fix themselves together differently, which changes it from a poison into a superfood. It has got all the formulaic badges that you would want. 
vegan friendly, non-GMO, halal certified, vegan, organic, 90% less calories than sugar. It's actually been clinically proven, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled human trials, not rats and mice. It's been clinically proven to decrease subcutaneous and belly body fat, control appetite, and inhibit the body's ability to assimilate new fat. So it's got amazing health benefits in addition to all the badges that you would want. The most compelling figure on this slide is according to IFIC, International Food Information Council, less than 15% of Americans have ever heard of this sugar, which gives us a greenfield opportunity. Now, I've been doing this for almost two years, building out the infrastructure for this company. I think that number is actually less than 5%. Next slide, please. Market's huge, obviously. Sugar's found within 80% of foods and beverages in this country. There's more than 60 ways to hide sugar on a nutrition label. While we do have a global penetration plan and a hub and spoke model, I do have the ability to extend in the, in, out throughout the globe day one. Our supply chain has been designed to ship domestically and internationally. We think the $2 trillion grocery portion of the $3 trillion consumer product goods industry in this, in this, in, in this country is going to be enough to get us going. Next slide, please. I'm trying to speed up since we got held up. We've got obviously a multi-pronged approach to the business, and we'll talk through a lot of that. The primary prong for the business is the direct-to-consumer model over the internet. To your point, I could not build a sustainable or a scalable business being subject to the whims of a Cargill or a Nestle or a Unilever. Couldn't do it. Nor the Kroger's and the Publix's of the world where I would be vying for shelf space. That's very, very expensive. And to your point, this is very much an early adopter type of model where education and awareness is going to become paramount. Direct to consumer is the answer. If you look at what Lip Kit's doing, Gymshark, Fashion Nova, you look at what Movement Watches is doing, these companies are going from zero to 100 to 500 million to a billion dollars overnight. My favorite story is Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club was started 110 years after Gillette. They doubled Gillette's revenues in three years. Razor Blaze on the internet. Once we decided we were going to go in a direct to consumer model and went right to the Don Corleone of social media and internet marketing, marketing uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. So we know Gary V. We deployed almost our whole first round of capital with Gary to develop the name Jaka, logo, branding, theming, iconography, packaging, e-com infrastructure. It's all done. This second round funds inventory. So it's uh, a very interesting way for us to address the market one-to-one, -one, educate, create awareness. We're also working with a guy named Phil Laboon, lead stacker. He's another big tech guy. He's mastered funnels on the internet. He's got a heavily integrated funnel CRM system that we're gonna be using. And in order to foster, again, education and awareness, we've created a number of health and well-being modules that we're going to be offering to the consumer to add value and then bundling Jaka in, using it as the catalyst because of all the aforementioned merits for this actual sugar. Next slide, sir. Naturally, we're developing products, developing SKUs. I love the CBD space. Highly fragmented, no thought leader, no dominant brand, explosive growth. The interesting component here is when I build a product in the CBD space that's got Jaka in it and all the aforementioned health benefits, I'm gonna be able to put that stuff on my label and that's a massive differentiator in a, in a space that's crying out for a leader versus all these other sweeteners that these other guys are using where they're basically injecting carcinogens into their formulas. We're working with a, a, a big beverage manufacturer. We started out with these guys developed one drink. We went with one Jaka powered beverage. They put us in a blind taste test against nine people uh, with nine people against one of their current beverages that's doing really well in the market. Nine out of nine picked the Jaka Power beverage. We've now expanded these talks to include five drinks, three non-alcoholic, two alcoholic. So it's been a, a very fruitful partnership that we're working through the final throws of. As well, a, a worldwide distributor of confections and a gummy manufacturer. So these are all on the horizon, all to be introduced. Next slide, sir. Close to my heart, another prong of the business model is a voucher program that I've developed. Uh, it's important to note, I think, that in order to scratch my itch when I got into this business and got out of real estate development, I needed to crack the code for the impoverished community, which is what I come from. My dad was killed when I was 10 years old. I spent a huge chunk of my life in extreme rural poverty. I actually slept in my car at certain points while I was putting myself through Yukon. I get it. I know why sugar-related illness hits the impoverished the hardest by far, because sugar's super cheap and it makes crappy food taste good. That's how my grandmother did it. That's how she got me to eat dandelion soup when I, I'm 10 years old. So I figured out a way using a derivative of a patent that I co-authored in the 90s in tech 
to develop an apparatus and a mechanism to distribute this sugar into impoverished communities, accessibility being one of the major problems that the impoverished have. They don't have accessibility to good products. I've also cracked the code with the affordability, the other major problem for the impoverished. They can't afford good products by uh, putting us in a position where we're gonna be able to obtain subsidies. Healthcare providers have a $1.72 trillion annual problem with obesity and obesity-related illness. They can't move the needle. They're dying to proactively move the needle. You get them off of sucrose, you get them onto another sugar that they're gonna like the taste of, and you can have a needle moving event. The HMO that we're working with that's uh, helping us do some analysis found that, initially found that up to 20% of their at-risk customer base could save one hospital visit per year, and they value one hospital visit at $10,000. So if you look at the 220 million members across three healthcare companies, you're talking about a quarter of a, uh, $220 billion in savings per year alone from these three. Next slide, please. Again, back to my roots, 501c3, we have established the foundation for nutritional equality. I believe it's important. This helps the company propagate its message where the for-profit company cannot go. I can get into churches, I can get into community groups, I, community centers, I can get into school systems and really teach people about the notion of this sugar, the good health and well-being component of this sugar and help them wean themselves off of the toxic and poisonous cane sugar. There is no competition, right? You guys have all seen the news, erythritol, now the studies, heart attacks, strokes, tachycardia, sucralose, which is Splenda, downgraded by the FDA from caution to avoid, causes cancer, aspartame causes cancer, sweet and low causes cancer. They all, not only do they all cause cancer, they all taste like shit, right? So now, so now you've, got a, you've got a product that tastes like sugar and it's actually good for you. Paradigm shifting ingredient here with no presence in the United States. Financial projections are strong. 17 million in the first year, we talked about the direct to consumer model. I mean, it's just so effective. I've outsourced the supply chain, co-packing in Edison, New Jersey, 3PL in Greensboro, Georgia, the ability to scale the millions of packages day one, ship domestically and internationally, appreciates to 120 million in year four, 212 million in year five. And I think the, inter the in interesting note here, it's very important, I kind of stole Eric Anderson's thunder here from Top Golf. I'm a big fan of his. What he did in, in building that company and selling it to Callaway, I think, is just magnitudinal. So when he was putting the numbers together for his financial models, he distinguished between what he called core value and option value. So when he was putting together his numbers, he never put anything in his models initially that were not a person going to Top Golf, paying money to swing a club and hit a ball. Advertising revenue, sponsorships co-sponsorships, he called all of that option value or back pocket revenue. None of it was in his models. We did the same thing here. This is only direct to consumer sales of products and pouches of sugar. It's not distribution agreements. It's not co-branded deals that we're working in full effect. This is a great way for us to be pretty conservative about what we're doing with these numbers and, and then have a happiness problem, hopefully at the liquidity event two years, three years, four years from now. Team, this will be the fifth company I've built in the last 30 years, it's what you might expect. Our board of advisors is strong. Dr. Rona Applebaum was the first ever chief science officer at Coca-Cola, by far my favorite advisor. She's a monster in the space. Dr. Tom Oran's the inventor of Craisins for Ocean Spray, actually catapulted the company from a juice company into a food product juggernaut. Dorn Weninger ran the country of Mexico for Walmart, an $11 billion P&L. John Crane went to Southeast Asia 20 years ago and established the JP Morgan base of operations for them. He's a Wharton guy, super, super smart. Notably, John Majeski is new to the board. John is the founder and CEO of a public, uh, a private equity group in California. Not only did he agree to be on our board of advisors, but they're also investing in the company. And I know you guys know this, private equity groups almost never put money into early stage companies. They're always waiting for significant traction, MRR and all that good stuff. So it's a huge vote of confidence that they're gonna be putting money into the company. He also mentioned he'd be happy to talk to anybody as it relates. This round is a million and a half dollars at a $5 million pre-money valuation. Our first round was $250,000 at a $2 million valuation. I deployed almost all of that capital with Vayner. Well worth the money, I had six person, people on my team. Market segmentation work, competitive analysis, and all the infrastructure that we previously discussed. That's it, folks. I'm happy to open it up to questions. Oh, well, actually, we could talk exits, too. I thought I was going to get cut off. But the uh, exits, 
you can't even you can't even describe the number of exits, right? It could be a competitor, it could be a private equity group. What I like is the metric. Swerve Sweetener was purchased by Whipstitch, a private equity group out of New England, for 14.8x EBITDA. So if you look at our EBITDA numbers in year five, it's 80 million EBITDA, 212 million in revenue. That's a 1.1 billion dollar acquisition with a good comp for a multiple. So it's it's a very compelling and interesting uh, environment to be engaging in right now. Awesome. All right, let's get into some questions. Genji starting us. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank well, you. I hope we solve all these obesity problems. Um, so tell me more about, you know, how do you, what plant grows Jaka sugar and how do you get it? Um, and what kind of pricing are we talking about? It's a great, great question. So it was first discovered in the 1970s in jackfruit, kiwi, and figs. The problem is it's such a rare and delicate sugar that it couldn't be extracted without polluting it or destroying it, right? So enter enzymes, technology takes over. You can take the rust off an aircraft carrier anchor with enzymes, enter enzymes, and now you can extract psychose from any fructose. So obviously corn has fructose in it as well. So you literally can now get this extracted economically where you can monetize it and you can build products with it and actually meet a price point that the consumer will tolerate. So our cost of goods sold is 0.459 cents per ounce for the 16 ounce pouch and 0.449 cents per ounce, excuse me, per ounce for the 24 ounce pouch. The products, as you can expect, are gonna have much, much higher margins. I would be remiss though, if I tried to, to call those out today because we're still in the final throws of recipe formulation. It's gonna retail at about a buck an ounce. So that threads the needle between stevia at about 82 cents an ounce and monk fruit at a dollar and a quarter an ounce. So if you look at Mintel and you look at some of these other studies out there, 81% of consumers nowadays are paying more for products. They're paying up to get a better product. So we think by, by making it uh, thread the needle between those two, we've got a decent space. Great, quick follow-up. So how many jackfruits do we need to get an ounce of the Jaka sugar? That's the beauty of it, right? So if I, if, if I had to build a company where I was subject to the jackfruit population, I'd still be a real estate developer in Nashville. Because just no way, I mean, you've got, forget building a company where you're counting on the weather. There's just too much can go wrong. So the fact now that it can be extracted from any fructose, corn, any fruit has fructose in it. So really it's just a function of uh, the quality of the manufacturing process and drawing it from the raw materials. And uh, I'd have to get you some numbers depending upon the raw material that the manufacturer is using in order to provide you with, with those specific figures. So, so then it, it, your extraction process, is that your own proprietary? Is it IP'd or how do you protect your? It's a great question. Because according to IFIC, less than 15% of Americans have ever heard of this sugar, we made the decision to start out bringing it into this country basically as an importer because we've got an opportunity to build the brand. I can be building the Jaka brand over the next two years, establishing myself as the thought leader with these lifestyle modules, establishing myself as the dominant brand. But we are currently doing site selection to build our own manufacturing facility as well so that we can command the whole supply chain. So we're looking at spots in Sacramento. There'll be manufacturing IP associated. But what I didn't want to do, being a real estate developer, I know this all too well, I didn't want to wait two years to build that plant to then introduce the sugar because I would have forfeited the opportunity. So basically that, that's going to come up, uh, come up through the middle, meet 18 months, two years from now, after burner effect, cost of goods sold through the floor. Mm -hmm. What is the barrier to entry for this market and this product? It's, it's really hard to say. I mean, the barrier to entry really, anybody with any money can enter any market, right? If I decided to build an electric car tomorrow and I had a ton of cash, I could do it. If I wanted to introduce a new tequila, I could do it. Bottle of water, I could do it. So really, anybody that's got the money and, and the wherewithal could do it. But I will share that we've been developing this model over about a year and a half. It took me six months to vet the supply chain. We evaluated 30 plus suppliers throughout Asia, Southeast Asia, and Europe, DQ'd 26 of them. Look and feel, mouthy feel, taste, color, molecular analysis across the spread, uh, the spec sheet to make sure that it was what it said it was. 26 out of 30 went. We landed on four. So I've got four supplier agreements on three different continents, which ensures redundancy at the highest level in the supply chain in order to bring this in. As well, we're developing, as I mentioned, these lifestyle modules because Consumers nowadays want value add. They want, to be, they want to be finding something compelling behind the company that they're procuring product from, behind the owners of the company that they're procuring product from. They want to be learning something. It took us nearly a year to develop the modules that I talk about. So we consider that to be you know, a pretty modi aspect of the business as well. The voucher program is patentable. 
It's a derivative of a patent that I co-authored in the 90s in tech, a 700-page patent. That's probably the modiest out of, out of everything in the model. Am I talking too fast? This is what she's thinking. So I, um, yeah, Tori, integrated supply chain is a risk, but also a benefit for cost and other and security. But also investors like it a founder and a CEO that really has tenacity because we know that you're going to bind into this and not let go. We can't shake you loose of this. So that's what we want to see. So really, really interesting idea. It's a, it's a challenging market to unseat or to bind into these other manufactured sweeteners, but it's a great product and a great idea. Yeah. It's an interesting market for sure. If it wasn't for the internet, I'd still be a real estate developer. I was printing money in Nashville. I was, I'm in my 50s, but daughter's going off to college. I had zero reason to jump into the sugar business. So uh, I, I did a lot of analysis up front. Just out of curiosity, you mentioned that this product is available in Japan. How is it doing there? Absolutely crushing it. it to give you a, 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 an axiom, Japan, the country of Japan, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars building manufacturing facilities for this sugar, not for export, only for use inside the country. So literally, it's 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 something that they they embraced long ago. They call it rare sugar over there. It's that simple. Something they embraced long ago, and it's it's in virtually all their foods, like stevia is here. Thanks, Thanks folks. Bring your <laughs> Thank you so much, Pete. Great job. Uh, next, we're gonna bring up Luca. Scott. Again, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. We're having obviously some issues. Uh, one of our programs crashed, so we're working around that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, I, I uh, <clears throat> have a really tough gig here after going. So you're saving lives over here, and he's gonna he's gonna solve uh, obesity problems around the world. And uh, but uh, I will say that I'm I'm also solving a really really big problem that's going to impact uh, millions of people. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to Luca. Uh, this is the first AI-powered reading app that uses the power of AI and speech recognition to help struggling readers learn how to read. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The impact is huge. Um, we know that the impacts of COVID have been, uh, the residual effects of COVID have been pretty, pretty significant. But uh, what most people don't realize is Two in five kids, that's about 26, 28 million kids just in the U.S., um, can't read at grade level. <clears throat> and we talk about kids with dyslexia. It's very under underdiagnosed. One in five kids that are in school today have some form of dyslexia. And 80% uh, of those kids are undiagnosed. So what does that mean? That means they're not getting the proper academic support that they need while they're in school. So they drop through the cracks. <clears throat> So the impacts are huge across their life. They don't, they don't graduate high school. You know, there's a lot of, we, we could talk a lot, a lot about what happens, but the impacts on parents, families, and teachers are huge. And I am one of those parents, okay? My son, Luca, has dyslexia. So that's kind of how I've got to this point. So I've experienced what, what these people are going through. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, we have built the first AI-powered reading tutor um, using the power of speech recognition. It's really, really important. It's the hardest part of the technology that we built and AI to deliver custom content with targeted interventions that are designed to drive engagement and inspire confidence in these students. Next slide, please. We have developed, I've worked with CMU for the last three years uh, to build a proprietary, uh, three proprietary modules. And we've won some awards recently, including we'll be, we're the semifinalists at the South by Southwest uh, Ed, Ed Tech Conference, which is next week. I'm sorry, next month. And um, <clears throat> we are semifinalists for one of the top innovators there. Um, so we have three core modules. Um, our first is our speech recognition technology, which I mentioned is really hard. We're doing phonetic level recognition. What does that mean? That is the actual individual sounds of the word. So I think someone else mentioned to me earlier that, uh, uh, I think Pete, you mentioned that you had a friend that's doing um, some work at Amazon. They're doing word level recognition. I'm sure they probably are doing uh, some, some phonetic level, but 
this part is extremely difficult, especially when we're dealing with kids that have speech impediments that, you know, talk with their hands here or talk real quiet, or it's hard to articulate sounds. We want to identify the sounds. And then what we do is we actually feed that information into our AI machine learning, deep learning modules that this, this is how we can scale the platform that can actually build custom reading plans for these students. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we feed them into our story labs component, which is generating this dynamic content for these students. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this is a great visual for you to understand what we're doing on the left here. You'll see, I asked a question to this student. I said, Hey, if you had any favorite superhero powers, what would it be? And he said, I want to do teleportation. I said, wow, that's pretty cool for a nine-year-old. I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I want to travel the world. I said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you read some stories. We're going to identify the sounds, those phonetic, those are the grapheme phoneme pairs of the word. And what we're going to do is we're going to build you a custom story based upon your interests, your reading age, your reading level, and your targeted grapheme phoneme pairs that we integrate into the stories. Okay, so think about that. We've got fifth graders reading at a first grade reading level. What are we doing for those for those kids? We're giving them first grade reading materials and saying, go read this story. What do you think they're going to say? I don't want to read that baby book, right? They want to read age appropriate material at their reading level. And that's going to that's how they build their confidence up. So um, next slide, please. So this is just a quick uh, I don't think this is a uh, this is not the actual deck. This is a PDF, right? Yeah, so I can't show you some screens. I had a little working video here, but um, this is actually an example of how they would identify their interests. We asked a series of questions. We have, you know, 40, 50 questions that we've established that are all based upon age. So they select that and they can actually see it on the reading screen, which I can't show you right now, but uh, it's one sentence at a time. They do not see a whole block, a block of text. They can see one screen, one sentence at a time. They can click on a word and they can actually have it sounded out to them. So if they get stuck on a word, they can, you know, this is designed for them to kind of do at their own pace. They could do in a classroom. Um, but again, this is something if they were to read a book at home, they would actually be working with a platform like this. Um, next slide. In terms of uh, the, the markets, uh, this is an evergreen opportunity. Okay, we have over a million kids in the U.S. coming in and be having having some form of dyslexia. Okay, so uh, when these numbers that I have are specifically related to dyslexia only. Okay, so we think this market is much much larger than what, what the numbers I have here. But uh, 14 million kids in the U.S. <clears throat> um, if we're charging uh, on on a school on a st per student basis, 150 dollars for the year, um, and and from a SAM perspective. We think there's a, a market penetration that we can get to. That's a that's a subset of that of that TAM. Uh, on a global basis, we're going to talk about that in a minute. There's a really huge opportunity as it relates to um, the ESL market, uh, and we have a we have a partnership that we're going to be um, entering into that's going to get us access to this. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, in terms of traction, we're still early on, even though we're working on this for the last two and a half three years. Um, really, really have just started with the in advent of ChatGPT. So uh, we, as I mentioned, we've been working with Carnegie Mellon University. We have some pilot programs that we set up with some schools. We're talking to around um, 40,000, uh, the schools that we're talking to total around 40,000 kids in those schools. Um, and we're working with the Pennsylvania Department of Education right now to try to, um, <clears throat> you know, feel, feel how we can bring this to that because they're doing so, a lot of re- um, uh, redoing of their funds, the funding structure in the in Pennsylvania. So uh, in terms of um, conferences, I mentioned that we've, we've had some good traction here related to some awards that we won. Uh, our partnership that we're talking about is with Global Expansion Strategies. They're a U.S.-based um, organization over 30 years uh, of international work. They just entered, a, he just messaged me about an hour ago and told me that they got their, they got a deal for um, 300,000 kids in India. And uh, they need an English, they need a literacy uh, component, and they need a math. So they want to, they they picked us to be their literacy component for their for their um, for their pilot. 
Next slide, please. In terms of uh, competition, um, there is not anybody at this point that is doing dynamic um, content generation and incorporating phonetics uh, and incorporating speech recognition technology. So um, the other two competitors have, uh, they're in the space now. Amir has been in there for about seven years and uh, they've raised about $10 million. <clears throat> Again, static content targeted a, a smaller age. We can target a very large age group. That's what I'm most excited. My son is uh, 17 now. And I say to myself, how do I help kids that have fallen through the cracks? And that is a problem because these kids are, these kids are left behind. So they they are, they, there is no opportunity for them to, uh, to kind of catch up. So um, in the last thing that I'll mention that I don't have on the slide, that's really important to consider is scalability. Everything is automated. We, the, um, the platform that we've designed is continuously assessing the students, the readers, so that they can identify what their um, challenges are, and we automatically change their, their structure. We can increase the complexity of the text, the reading material, the sounds that we're putting into the story, so, um, so we, can, we can really grow with the student over a long period of time. Next slide. Great team, as I mentioned, we work with Carnegie Mellon University. We have some neurosurgeons on our team. Um, we have guys that are in the AI school uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Jack has um, built two AI reading tutors over his last 20 years. He's just a phenomenal um, teacher as well as uh, some people, um, some, some professors that are in the natural language processing school. Next slide, please. In terms of business model, we're uh, a SaaS-based business. Uh, target B2B schools. Uh, you guys have talked about some B2C stuff. I, I'd love to share some of the things that we're doing in that space. I think there's a pretty big opportunity there because of the, the family need. Um, and um, in terms of, I mentioned about our go-to-market strategy with uh, global expansion strategies, that, that's targeted uh, two to three million in booked revenue over the next 12 to 18 months. And um, in terms of, uh, we just launched a, a digital ad campaign, and we are already on the first page of Google for um, for three terms, which are which are really hard to get to. But um, we did that a couple of months ago, and we're doing pretty good there. And last thing on schools is that we're doing we're really kind of focused on virtual and charter schools right now because I think that's really where the opportunity lies for quick adoption versus a public school that might take longer to make those decisions. So, next slide, please. Uh, I have uh, talk about investment next, but um, we've been in touch with a lot of groups and um, everyone is very interested, uh, but they're not interested in taking the lead. So I am I am here to look for a lead investor. Uh, these are some people that have all expressed interest in doing follow on investments after we find that lead investor. So uh, some of these are the biggest names in um, the ed tech space, uh, Reach Capital, everyone knows injuries and Horowitz. Imagination Learning Ventures. That's a um, public. You need me to go. Um, that's a um, publisher. We'll we can talk about that separately later. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of where we are, in terms of investment opportunity, we're looking to raise um, two million dollars in a post money safe round right now. Uh, we have a two tiered structure: uh, five hundred thousand with a twenty percent discount, with a four million dollar cap. And then the second tranche is for the million and a half um, and at a 15% discount. So uh, looking at 81% margins, this is a this is a really very profitable business uh, once we kind of start hitting scale here. Next slide, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, we have just a, a few minutes here for questions. Whoever wants to start, lovely Leah. Yeah. This is a really important uh, product that you're building. Um, yeah. I used to be a special education teacher, and so I have a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> how is this specifically addressing dyslexia, and have you had this vetted by a dyslexia specialist? Because it seems like a great product for any student that wants to learn how to read. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the beauty, is it really can apply to all readers. It does not need to be specifically for dyslexia. We've uh, we've assembled um, seven different studies, uh, evidence-based research studies, to assemble this product. Uh, my focus has always been about dyslexia because of my son. That's sort of the genesis of what we came from. But um, 
We're using structured literacy in the platform. Our team just met this morning with the dyslexia team at a local university. And uh, one of the people in our advisory group, she runs a, uh, a dyslexia focused school. So she's very familiar with all the different ways of approaching dyslexia. Uh, I just finished meeting last week with the Pennsylvania uh, International Dyslexia Association, the head of that. And so we think there's opportunities um, not only in dyslexia, but beyond that. And we're incorporating different things because as a teacher, you'll, re you'll know there's the thing called reading war war wars and everyone has their opinion about what's um, uh, the goal here is about driving um, driving engagement. And if we can do some things and add different components in that'll touch on different areas, I think we can be successful with that. And what kind of training needs to be done for teachers to use this in classrooms? If your target is schools, a lot of where I see ed tech fall apart is when teachers don't know how to utilize the tool and then it becomes this great tool that no one knows how to use. Yeah. It's, it's first off, it's a scalability factor. So I think that there is some challenge with this in school because you have to read out loud, okay? So we can't have a room of 30 kids all reading out loud. So if we work in small groups, um, we have we have some ideas around kind of doing small group reading. If you had to read one-on-one -on -one to the class, we have, it, we, we're, we have an idea of how we could actually set that up to generate your reading material that you're gonna read to the story that's again, to your interest reading level and that you could be confident in reading in front of the class. So uh, as opposed to, hey, read this and everyone's like, you're not that, you know, you're really struggling with this, you know, and you're embarrassed. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's my son. So. Great questions, by the way. Any more? Yeah. <laughs> really good. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to take a different tack and um, compliment you that I know what you're doing on slide one. And so we, I just have an absolute rule that if I don't know what you're doing by slide three, I'm, I'm just out of it. Yeah. And so you have different firms that are receiving 100, 200, 300 pitches a week. Yeah. And they want to they want to tranche you into something that they know and something that they're good at. And if you don't hit that tranche and they're trying to figure it out on slide 6, just doesn't work. So that's yeah. really great that you did that. Great. Uh, just also congratulations on South by Southwest. We've just agreed to do a mini Lions Den at South by on Sunday with the worship track. So it's something that we'll see you there. It's great. Sunday. Uh, the it's third. a Sunday of the South by Southwest. Okay, we'll talk after. I yeah, that. that's great. Okay. Nice job. Thanks. So um, I think it's a, a great product, and uh, I might want to use it myself. It's for fun. Um, now, it's um so so it sounds like the components that it you know what what differentiates your products that it's the AI it generates the content the students love, and then you help them with some of the phonemes and stuff like that. Um, now tell me in terms of you know like what how hard is it for somebody else uh, to catch up and try to develop something kind of similar? Well, it's a huge market. You certainly can get a big yeah. piece of it, but I'm just curious, like you know, what would you know? How do you evaluate that kind of thing? Yeah, so we're patent pending, number one. Okay. okay, so we did file some patents, uh, you know, initially, and I have to I have to close that out here coming up in the next uh, three months. But um, the angle of having Carnegie Mellon behind us and that that knowledge of speech recognition and what we're doing, like we're we're actually rein we're reinventing our speech recognition right now with with twelve with seven students, uh, all all master level students. So we're going to take like our speech recognition from here to here. I, I think it's just going to be really hard for people to knowing the products that are out there to bring that component in and create the dynamic. Anybody can create a story in chat GPT, um, but bringing in that speech level recognition, that's a whole nother component that I've not seen out there. And, you know, can someone do it for sure? I mean, I, I'm sure someone's going to probably listen to me and want to steal the idea right now. But um, no, I think if we get ahead of the market, that's really the focus. Uh, that's why I want to go after this international opportunity in the ESL market and uh, just start gathering, getting like, you know, million users, 2 million users overseas. And we would actually look to go to right to publishers um, in the U S because that's the distribution market in the U S is you go to publishers that are already entrenched in the school districts. They'll want to just, 
roll it out. One of those partners I mentioned is up there. They've already talked to us and would be like to make an investment, but then they'd be looking to put, put, put that into their publishing network in the school. So. So Carnegie Mellon is helping you to improve the speech recognition. How much, like, do you pay them a license fee or how, how does it work in terms of the relationship? No, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, it's not, it's really not that complicated. We we're doing a capstone program with them. So um, I pay to actually engage these, these students. Um, we've had the highest demand out of all of the capstone programs. Companies bring problems to them, to CMU. CMU helps those companies solve those problems. And students get to select which projects they want to do as part of their senior. This is their, their master level students in AI and innovation. So this is their, this is their like thesis. And so they, they really get into it. So we have seven kids. We have, we've had the most out of any other groups. And uh, I compete against like, Bank of New York, Mellon. I, I mean, we have some really big companies and the kids always want to come and work with us because of the social impact of what we're doing. So uh, we don't have any, uh, there's no baggage or I think licensing fees that we have to pay or IP. We own the IP and and that's uh, that's pretty cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, last we have Sajol from Advanced Telesensors. Um, after this, we will be sharing the slides. I know he didn't get to show the video off, but we will be sharing those with everybody. So you'll have all of that after in your follow-up. All right, take it away. So uh, it's been uh, the last couple of presenters have sort of shared some pretty dramatic cardiovascular issues. So I wanted to start with the slide and ask you to think about your family or friends, people that you know, and raise your hand if you know someone who's had a heart attack or at risk of heart failure. So that's what I want to talk about to cover. Next slide. So I'm Sajol Goshal, CEO of Advanced Telesensors. What we are doing is the problem we're solving is reducing hospital readmissions of heart patients that cost insurers billions of dollars and many lives are lost. The answer is a heart monitor that's always on and can remotely alert your nurses or doctors of any abnormal heart rhythms so that these cardiac activities can be prevented. Put yourself in the position of a cardiologist who from time to time loses patients or needs to send them to critical care. What he wants is a way to remotely monitor his patients and get early warnings on cardiac events so that he can adjust his treatment, thus saving lives and reducing penalties for Medicare due to readmissions. So we have a revolutionary way of doing this. It was developed at NASA. It's a touchless heart monitor that doesn't use any wearables. detects micro vibrations of your heart using radar and sends critical alerts so that treatment can be adjusted in time. So why am I so excited about this team? I've known Frank for over 20 years. I trust him. He's our COO and CFO. Dr. Jason Zagrasvi is our chief medical officer and a heart rhythm specialist. The rest of the team have all the skills necessary to bring this product to market. I'm a serial executive with three successful exits, totaling $3 billion. So why am I so passionate about this business? My father passed away at a young age of 51, and it had a huge impact on me. I realized I made a mistake focusing on engineering alone. So now I'm making up for lost time and focusing on healthcare and I need your help. So what is so compelling about this product that our customers want? By law, Medicare requires at least 16 days of monitoring data out of 30. We are the keystone to Medicare reimbursements because we enable automatic data gathering of our, of our patients without them doing anything or wearing anything. This is not doable with wearables. So how big is this market? We have strategically focused the company on the skilled nursing market, our beachhead market of $1.5 billion. 
which is part of the $31 billion remote patient monitoring market that's growing quite rapidly. So who are our customers? Our customers are patient care integrators who already have established customers. This makes our customer acquisition cost very low. So cardio enables the entire RPM package to be reimbursed by our integrators. So how do we make money? We sell the hardware and we license the software on a monthly basis. So how do we know that the market really wants our product? So we are, de are designed and deployed in three nursing homes. And we have started clinical studies with University of Texas in San Antonio and the Texas Cardiac Arrhythmia. Our, our patient care integrators have access to over 200,000 beds. And we are, we are making revenue right now from Medicare reimbursements. So why is this an exciting opportunity for you? Our five-year projections are $102 million with high profit margins. And we will be profitable after two small rounds of funding. This minimizes investor dilution and gives us a great exit. So here are some recent acquisitions of uh, companies that have cardiac monitors by very large uh, medical companies. Our technology will be more for strategic acquisition, may not necessarily be multiples of sales, and may be in the short term. So we are raising a, convert a bridge loan. It's a convertible note uh, for $2.5 million, and we've raised half a million dollars to date so that we can achieve our FDA class device and have an ARR of a million dollars. The cap on the note is $10 million. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Great job. Let's move it over to the panel. Who is ready? Sure. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so how does the touchless monitoring work again? So it's a radar. It, uh, you mount it on the wall, a small device. Mm -hmm. uh, you mount on the wall. When you shoot within 10 feet of the device, it will pick up your heart rate and respiratory rate continuously. Mm -hmm. And if you see any bradycardia, tachycardia events, we will we'll send an alert. Gotcha. And um, so so if the patients kind of travel around, you kind of bring it with you. Yeah, so normal movement we track. Uh, obviously, we cannot be in a gym. That's one of the big markets that would be very interesting. But your regular rep repetitive movement will not be, uh, will, will affect your heart rate uh, detection. Sure. So what do you need to get it approved? So we have already gone through the FDA. We've had three meetings with the FDA. And we and they've raised the bar. That's one of the three meetings that have occurred. But we've got the pre-submission approved. And so now it's a matter of three quarters of a million that we need off that two million we're raising that will drive the validation and clinical trial. Do you need to do any, like, clinical trials? Yeah, FDA now wants our, our previous predicate device didn't do it, but they want us to do it. So we have to do three sites with uh, 30 people each, which is 90, 90 uh, people in the, in the plan. Thank you. So it's non-invasive, so I'm assuming the trials are pretty minimal. The trials are pretty minimal, yeah. Okay. Just a matter of getting the demographics right. And, and then how far does the radar reach? So I, your example of you know, in the bedroom, great, understand that usage model. Right. What about for the person in uh, the assisted living facility or even the you know, not assisted living facility? Right. So for assisted living, we find that most of the rooms are within that 10 by 10 foot area or 12, and we can pick up the person within that room. We didn't want to go past 10 because we didn't want to pick up people on the corridor walking through. So if you need more coverage, like right now, we have got uh, two pilots going with PAM Health. We've got our uh, unit in the bedroom and one in the living room. Because when people get who have commodities, they don't move around a whole lot. So they're in the bedroom, and then they're in the living room for the next eight hours watching TV. And we can get good coverage from that from both sides. Um, creative idea. I love the cross-industry utilization of technology. Um, this is definitely something I'd like to talk about. Thanks. So it sounds like your target customer is the nursing home kind of. Right. Okay. Um, can it only detect one person? 
Yes. So right now, we are a single target detector. Uh, as we grow the company, we can do multi-targets. Radar allows you to do multi-targeting. It's just a matter of changing the software. And how does that work? Like, does the person that's being detected have to wear some type of device? Nope, to... absolutely nothing. So your heart pounds and we pick up the vibration from the surface of your body. It's very minute. And so a lot of it is the AI and, and uh, machine learning algorithm that were developed by NASA to put that in place. So if there are two people in the room, what happens? If there are two people in the room, we get a mixed signal. Uh, and so we don't pick it up. Uh, if you look at the way we actually mount the device, we, we came up with a very simple way to mount because deployment was very, very important. Uh, so it mounts on the wall. It's got about a 45-degree angle. And so it picks up the person right on the bed. So you can have a, a nurse or a caregiver on the side. It will not necessarily pick them up. If they put their head in under the beam, yes, they're going to get picked up. Okay, but it's a, unlikely. If it does happen, obviously the person's in trouble. And you collect the data. So is there any kind of policy that needs to be implemented to make sure that the data is safe? Yeah, so we are connected through a HIPAA compliant cloud. It's one of the other uh, companies we work with. So we outsource the cloud. And so they are fully HIPAA compliant. And then we connect it to apps or to a, 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 a browser that you can connect to. Most of our uh, customers do connect directly to our API. Uh, and they are actually putting the rest of the information together. So they build the next level of AI around it where they integrate more information and provide a more comprehensive view to uh, cardiologists. No, that's really good questions and good presentation. Is there a discount if we buy one today, or what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. We got a 20% discount on the web. So we've been selling on the web for the past year. Uh, we just got engaged with the, uh, with the uh, integrators. The best part of the integrators is they carry water. So I don't have to build the hardware. They actually take that over. So we've now made it a much, that's one of the things the customer acquisition costs are really like much lower. Great. We actually do have another minute. If anybody in the audience has uh, an additional question, happy to get that answered for you now. All right. Well, then thank, thank you, you so much, Sajol. Great job. All right. Awesome. Yeah, that was our last presentation, but we do have uh, happy hour food and alcohol over in that corner. So please, we encourage you to indulge as much as you want. Please uh, give one more round of a hand, round, round of applause uh, to our amazing presentations and uh, founders today. And keep it going for our judges on the panel who asked amazing questions as well. Um, get to know our founders during our networking portion. We'll be here for about another hour. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about 10, there are plenty of uh, our team members around as well to answer those. Thank you again, guys. And uh, yeah, enjoy.